Ahoy crew, welcome back aboard the Maritime History Podcast. Today we embark on episode 39, Aftermath and Mikuli. When we pushed pause last time, the sun had set at Salamis. Thanks to the combined manipulation from Themistocles and solid battle strategy that exploited the weaknesses in Persia's navy, Greece had emerged victorious. The Persian ships had withdrawn back to Phaleron at Athens, since Persia's army still held the city and much of the region surrounding. Greece perhaps expected to get a little sleep at Salamis Island that night, but then to go back in for round two of their face-off with Persia the following morning. Dawn broke, and while the Persian army was still in view across the channel, few, if any, ships were to be found. Persia's navy had largely fled, electing to not suffer any further loss this late in the sailing season of the Aegean. It was pretty clear evidence of the massive victory that Greece had won, although I can't help but suspect that Themistocles might have been a little disappointed to not get the chance to land a death blow victory over the entire Persian force at Salamis. He had come quite close to having that chance after he engineered the victory at Artemisium and then repeating, really topping that feat now at Salamis. We'll get a little bit more into the competing drives of Themistocles and his opponents in the Greek leadership circle, but let's continue the thread for a bit here by following Persia. Although the Greeks didn't know it, in the immediate aftermath of Salamis, that night in their camps, the Persian navy had reached the end of its time off Greece and really in the Aegean. Xerxes probably ordered the breakup, but in rather short order, the Persian ships all disbanded and sailed home to their various ports of call. Herodotus goes through the dramatization of the scenes where Persia's players debate the course of action. Queen Artemisia makes another appearance in this scene. She gives advice to Xerxes because she has become a trusted advisor of his by this point in the story, in the war. Although, I mean, it's clear to us in the Herodotus version that Xerxes should have started listening a little earlier, like we saw play out in the Salamis episode last time. The ultimate decision, as it's agreed to by Xerxes, um, but then proposed and supported by Mardonius, who was a military advisor, and then Artemisia supports this plan also. The plan is that Xerxes and most of his forces will withdraw from Greece. Things needed doing back in the homeland, after all. Persia's empire was made up of many subject states, and when news of the empire's defeat spread, well, they probably anticipated local revolts that do tend to pop up after events such as this. The greater reality prior to this Greek misadventure, as the Persians may have seen it, is that they were a land-focused empire. Persia's navy was bolstered for this war with Greece, and the navy was really a cobbled-together one, made up of the smaller navies taken from Persia's subject states. The Phoenicians, the Egyptians, etc., the Ionian regions of Greek colony states as well. The repeated humiliation that Persia's naval forces had been subjected to over the course of the war that we have now witnessed most of, it must have pushed Xerxes over the edge when it came to any thought that he could rely on a navy in the future. Quickly after Salamis, the navy was just sent away. The Phoenicians back to their homeland, and the Egyptians leave the scene entirely. Perhaps they went straight back to Egypt, even. Only a small fraction of Persia's once massive number of ships even hung around in the vicinity of Greece, and this was a 300-ship contingent that withdrew to Anatolia. 
perhaps these were ships that came from the Ionian cities originally, cities that had fought with Xerxes throughout the war, although we don't really get a breakdown. What is clear is that after Salamis, Xerxes placed no further faith in naval strength to help him defeat Greece. It's possible that it went even beyond that degree, too, as his rapid withdrawal and his refusal to rebuild the navy can be viewed as evidence that he feared any new naval confrontation with Greece. Perhaps the Greek mastery of the sea was so comprehensive that Xerxes effectively ceded that domain over to them altogether. Regardless of his intent, of his mental state, this seems to be how it played out in practice. After the Persian retreat from Greece kicks into gear, then, we see that Xerxes sent a fraction of ships north to the Hellespont to guard the ship bridge that was actually still floating there. This is what had allowed his army to get over from Asia into Europe earlier in the war, and since his forces are now retreating back to Asia, they of course needed a way to march back across the Hellespont, thus making this bridge fairly important. Otherwise, as we have said, a lot of the ships just departed back to their respective homes. The navy was effectively broken up. Herodotus does also include a humorous yet dark story that he heard about the Persian retreat. I'm going to go ahead and read it in translation here, since we're just about to the end of our discussion that can draw from Herodotus, and I really just don't want to miss a chance to read from him at least one last time. So here's the story as Herodotus tells it to us. It reads, quote, when Xerxes marched out of Athens, he came to Ion, near Macedonia, where he entrusted his army to be led to the Hellespont, while he himself boarded a Phoenician ship and went on his way to Asia by sea. As he was sailing along, however, he was overtaken by a violent wind, which created surging waves. As the storm grew more violent and the ship became endangered, as it was heavily laden with the many Persians who were traveling with Xerxes and who were now on deck, the king fell into a panic and shouted to the helmsman, asking if there was any way that they could be saved. The helmsman replied, My lord, there is none, unless we rid ourselves of these many men on board. Upon hearing this, Xerxes said, Men of Persia, it's now time for you to prove your care for your king, for in you, it seems, lies my safety. After he said this, his men prostrated themselves, leapt out into the sea, and the now lightened ship sailed safely to Asia. As soon as Xerxes stepped onto shore, he gave the helmsman a gift of a golden crown in return for saving his life. But then, because the helmsman had been responsible for the death of many Persians, he had his head cut off. That one is a bit of a roller coaster there, right? I feel like life with Xerxes would have been a roller coaster probably a lot of the time. Herodotus himself casts doubt on this particular story, uh, rightly so, I would say. He does make the point that it seems unlikely that the Persians would have been first to go over the side, which, you know, is pretty logical. I think it was more likely that they would have been sent below and that the Phoenician rowers might have been viewed as more expendable and they probably would have been the ones to lighten the ship's load by taking the permanent swim. The short version of this whole discussion up to now is basically that after Salamis, Persia's navy threw in the towel and went home. The second piece to Xerxes' reaction after Salamis pulls us away from the navy aspect a little bit, but I think it's still important to touch upon because it's a good opening for us to make a transition away from the Persian War here narrowly and into a few of the issues that will start to take center stage for us 
going forward more broadly. Mardonius, as we said, was one of the advisors who recommended that Xerxes withdraw the navy. Mardonius was hoping a little bit to save his own reputation after Persia's defeats leading up to and at Salamis, so he volunteered to personally handpick a portion of the Persian army and then to remain in Greece. He hoped to finish the war by defeating the Greeks on land there without utilizing the naval strength that they thought would be their main salvation. Persia, of course, as we said, always kind of thought in a land-based, land-centric way anyhow. Mardonius then wanted to save his own reputation. He volunteered to remain in Greece with part of Persia's army. It is a little hard to fathom from our perspective looking back that they really believed they could win a full-out continuation of the war as it had been fought and dramatically lost up to this point. But Herodotus does include a discussion that might more fully illuminate Persia's game plan after Salamis. After Mardonius had done some work to prepare his selected forces, for the next attempt at defeating Greece, he was marching back toward Athens. This is in 479 BCE, I should point out, which puts us in the year following Salamis. He had been in Thebes, which is a Greek city not too far north of Athens, but he's marching back to the city now. The Thebans advise him to make a base near their city, Thebes, since he would find it a little bit harder pushing further south, since Athens had reoccupied the city following Salamis that fall and winter afterward. Thebes' advice to Mardonius is um, that he would find it harder marching further south, and that they had a way that might help him more easily defeat the Greeks on the whole. They recommended that Further pitched battle was going to be pretty useless, since Greece was more unified, and that Persia's army was weakened, that they'd already been defeated many times, and that they would just be defeated again. However, Thebes says this, quote, But if you follow our recommendation, you will know all their intentions, and thereby gain the power to master and control them with ease. Just send some money to the most powerful men in their cities. You will thus divide Hellas against itself, and from then on, with the aid of your partisans, you will easily subjugate any who oppose you. Now, aside from some pretty obvious lessons that we of modernity should maybe take to heart there about the dangers of wealthy citizens being manipulated by foreign influence, I think that this story, this anecdote, gives us a good segue to now look at the Greek reaction to everything. Persia's navy has withdrawn, a portion of the army camps out in Greece. And so if we rewind the clock back to that night on Salamis, after Greece's great victory, but we now shift the focus over to Greece, we can pretty quickly see some fault lines beginning to form. The Greeks fully expected Persia's navy to row into formation that following morning. They had been bested on day one, but the bulk of their fleet still was actually intact, and it maybe even outnumbered Greece's fleet still, after the glaring victory that first day at Salamis. However, we're in the semi-omniscient third person's perspective here, right? So we know that the mental will of Xerxes and Persia's leadership had been broken, by the heavy losses that they suffered at Salamis. So, as the sun rises and Greece begins to look out from Salamis that following morning, it begins to dawn on them that the Persian navy has well and truly departed. Greece was still riding high on their victory, so the immediate reaction was to load up the benches, to embark the marines and other warriors, and to pursue the Persian fleet they couldn't have gotten too far away yet, right? So we see the Greek fleet saddles up quickly, and they give chase. 
But they only got as far as the island of Andros, and they hadn't even yet sighted any Persian ships. Andros is pretty far east relative to mainland Greece. It is farther east than all of the island of Euboea. So having made it that far east, the Greeks probably wisely decide to take a breather and to hash out what the next steps will be as agreed to by at least the majority of them. And, you know, as soon as the debate begins, this is where differing opinions and motivations begin to surface. So I think it's worth exploring this all a little bit as we continue our progress through the aftermath of Salamis. The simple breakdown of the major opinions that were voiced here at this council is that on one side was Themistocles and Athens, with the other side being Eurybiades and Sparta. These are the broad categories, anyhow. We've seen a few times how these two leaders and their two cities had differing opinions and perspectives about how best to wage their war against Persia, especially early on in that war. But when the war did finally reach Greece proper, especially Athens, the surrounding waters of Salamis, and it began to knock on the door of Corinth and Sparta, well, these two cities and everyone else found it a little easier to reach common ground. Of course, we've seen that Themistocles lended a helping hand to engineer events a few times to kind of force that common ground to happen. That's why he was such a fascinating historical character. However, now in our present discussion with the Greek fleet at Andros, they are far removed from mainland Greece. They're quite far removed from the Peloponnese and the immediate Spartan interest there. So the dynamic has shifted. Not to mention that the debate after Salamis shifts from one of immediate defense and immediate need to now becoming a debate about longer term and bigger picture strategy. As you would expect, a more complicated debate emerges. Themistocles at Andros is perhaps unsurprisingly the one advocating for continued pursuit of the Persians. Clearly, the Persian army was still at or near Athens, but the Greek fleet had proved its superiority, so Themistocles wanted to keep the focus where they knew they were superior. He wanted to hammer home the final blow, if they could. If they could find the Persian fleet, that was doable, but even if Persia's fleet had well and truly departed, Themistocles proposed that they should destroy the ship bridges that Xerxes had struggled to build so that they could at least strike a blow there. At first glance, this idea might seem like a good one. Persia is on its heels. Greece can land a pretty severe blow that cuts off escape. The problem is that Persia's army is still pretty massive, and that for all Greece knew, Persia's navy might have fallen back just to rebuild and regroup. The resources that the Persian Empire could draw from were almost bottomless, at least it seemed that way compared to those of Greece, so maybe the navy just planned to regroup, to come back, resupply the Persian land forces, and to continue the war. Cutting off the army's escape from Greece, then, would trap them in Europe, and it would almost force them to stick around in Greece, sucking the region dry, perhaps even picking off the cities one by one, and then if the navy did plan to come back, that would put Greece in a worse-off position to have to defend everything all over again. Effectively, it seemed like there was little sense in trapping the wounded animal inside the Greek house after they had landed some pretty good blows, but that they hadn't killed that animal altogether. Sometimes a wounded animal is even angrier, right? So don't trap him inside. Rather, open the door, leave the bridge intact, and let him escape if he truly wants to. He might live to fight another day, but once he's gone, you can close the door behind him, and hopefully buy yourself some more time to regroup as well. Actually, Themistocles wanted to destroy the bridge. It was Eurybiades and the Spartans 
who were the ones to argue that severing the bridge was unwise and would result in this scenario that we've just outlined. Their argument won the day at Andros. But as you should probably expect from the Themistocles that we know at this point, losing one argument was not enough to put him off his desired course of action. He conceded the debate that day at Andros, and the Greeks didn't continue pursuit then and there, nor did they go to the Hellespont to destroy the bridge. However, right here at this point, where the Greek victory at Salamis could have become the foundation of a unity that none of them might have even imagined prior to Persia's invasion, right at this point, where they maybe had a chance to begin down that road, it seems from my view that things begin heading down a different road, though perhaps it's more accurate to say that they continued down this road that Greece had pretty much been on for a long time, but had just taken a detour from temporarily. Greece had never been fully unified at any point in her storied past, right? So dreaming up potential unification scenarios is maybe a bit unrealistic. We can try to outline some of the reasons why unity was not achieved and why the seeds of future conflict were instead sown, but even just from taking what we know about Themistocles and his personality up to this point, you may be able to see where some of this is headed. Many historians argue that there was never a chance for unity after Salamis anyways, and that the fundamental differences between the social structure and the motivating concerns of Athens versus those of Sparta, that these were too far different and too far gone by the time that Persia invaded, that the invasion just provided the opportunity and the reason for short-term cooperation to defend against external threat, but that Athens and Sparta were destined to clash eventually no matter what. It's these types of debates that we'll talk about more as we move forward, but for now, we'll just say that the Athenian decision to focus on a naval buildup did pretty drastically change the character and the ceiling of the potential that Athens had as a city-state, that her shift toward naval power did have an immediate and noticeable impact on how things played out after the Greco-Persian War. Nevertheless, in the aftermath of Salamis, it was at least theoretically possible for all of the Greeks to have come together, a sight that would have made the Beatles and Timothy Leary proud, I think. However, it was not meant to be, and let's go ahead now and try to elucidate why. The Greek coalition, as we said, had landed on the island of Andros. The Persian fleet seems to have fled from Phaleron as quickly as they could, so the Greeks did realize that they were long gone. It made no sense to continue pursuit. As we said, also, Themistocles lost the debate to continue, they decided not to sever the bridge, and they decided that Greece really should try to keep its focus closer to home rather than send a fleet roaming around trying to reignite conflict with Persia. It is worth noting, too, at this point, that the fleet of Athens in particular was comprised of a huge percentage of her citizens who would have been in the army in other circumstances. Athens was actually still occupied by the Persian army at this point, and that Athens probably should worry a little bit more about that fact that her city was still occupied by a foreign invader. That was another point in the argument that Sparta made. Sparta was, of course, still worried about a Persian invasion of the Peloponnese, so this argument that they should worry about issues closer to home was self-serving to a degree, but it was also fairly smart, I suppose. The point that I'm trying to drive at here, though, is that the different mentalities between Athens and her leadership especially, and Sparta and their line of thinking, these do highlight how these two cities and their modes of thought tended to approach these types of decisions. Sparta was more concerned with the land factor, and that is of course where her main source of strength and influence 
still existed. Athens at this point seems like they have well and truly casted their fortune on the hope that sea power would continue to make them great, as it had already done. The fact that Athens had cast her fortune on that sea power that they had rapidly built up prior to the Greco-Persian War, it was a pretty wisely gambled cast. It wasn't a reliance on pure chance at all. We've seen several times now how through the vision of Themistocles and the opportunities that Athens' commercial and economic situation provided her, Athens chose to pursue the path of becoming a sea power and that it paid off in spades. After victory at Salamis, Themistocles and all the Athenian leaders must have understood that they held the upper hand when it came to naval power in Greece, and really in the entire Aegean, you could argue that even the entire eastern Mediterranean was at this point kind of at Greece's mercy when it comes to naval strength. Viewed from this perspective, though, it's a little bit more understandable that Eurybiades and Sparta, even Corinth and some of the other Greek city-states, would have also realized that Athens occupied a strong position and that they now needed to try to preserve their own positions of influence in the Greek world. With victory at Salamis, the focus quickly shifted from simply defeating Persia to now a jockeying for position of leadership amongst the Greek city-states and the power in the Aegean world that was newly liberated, or at least the leaders at Andros all understood that that is where things were headed in the very near future for them all. They weren't fully liberated yet, but they had done the heavy lifting. This is of course not to mention the just constant reality that there was underlying competition between and among all the Greek city-states that was historic by this point in Greece's history, and it was even there all throughout the Persian Wars, debates and arguments about decisions, how to approach battles, strategy, and such like that. Given those simmering differences, it really isn't a surprise that in the immediate aftermath of victory, that things would quickly come to the fore once again, after Persia's threat had been mostly removed. Still, though, they're debating this all at Andros, and technically, Mardonius and the Persian army were still in Greece. So, before we get too far ahead of ourselves into the strategy, the political conflict and difference, we should probably see Persia off the stage. As I've mentioned maybe twice now, Themistocles conceded the debate at Andros. He knew that Sparta had the majority on its side for that argument. But he did also know that Athens still held the lion's share of naval strength and future potential. So after conceding the debate and not pursuing Persia any further, he pulled his Athenian brethren aside and he sketched out for them his vision of the immediate gameplay for them all. In essence, he encouraged them all to be patient, knowing that they could not pursue Persia right away, but that they all shared the same goal to be able to do so as soon as they could. Themistocles basically encouraged them to head back to Athens to try to rebuild the city and to plan on continuing pursuit of reprisal against Persia the following spring. He paid lip service to the argument that Sparta had made too, he agreed that it might be unwise to put too much pressure on Persia so quickly after the serious defeat they had suffered that it might force Persia into a final and wrathful reaction that could potentially backfire on Greece. It's a little funny then, knowing that Themistocles really did want to defeat Persia quickly, that he was just going along with Sparta's victory in that debate, it's funny knowing that he wanted to pursue Persia and to cut off the army that we see what he does next. It doesn't really seem to match up. Herodotus says that on the same day that he was at Andros convincing his fellow Athenians to bide their time to not pursue Persia further, that he also arranged for his trusty servant Sicinus to take a ship 
and to once again make for the Persian camp that was still back at Phaleron. Themistocles had previously utilized misinformation tactics to draw Persia and Xerxes into disadvantaged spots or to influence the timing of engagements. We've seen that a few times. In those past cases, Themistocles was ostensibly doing it for the benefit of the allied Greek forces, although the outcomes did also serve to burnish the reputation of Themistocles, so it was self-interest as well. However, here after Salamis, in the ensuing debate, when he is forced to concede the decision to Eurybiades and to Sparta, Themistocles again employs some misinformation warfare, but it seems like he is doing it purely for his own benefit, almost taking out an insurance policy to cover his own self. While the Greeks were all still on Andros, Sicinus rose back to Athens, and he delivers another message to Xerxes. This time, he wants to let the Persian king know that his armed forces and his navy are able to effectuate a safe retreat, that Greece will not be in pursuit. Now, as we've seen, this was actually true. But it was true only because Sparta and the other city-states had disagreed with Themistocles' desire to pursue Persia. What Sicinus tells Xerxes, though, is that Themistocles is the one who had done all the work to hold back the other Greek forces from a frenzied pursuit, and that Persia could retreat in safety thanks to his exertions in the allied Greek council. An interesting twist here. Herodotus says that Themistocles played this ruse, quote, in order to secure a reserve of credit with the king, so that in case he were to suffer some calamity at the hands of the Athenians, he would have a refuge to run to. So it seems like Themistocles had a pretty solid grasp of the whims, the fluctuations of the democracy in Athens, and we will see that play out even further in good time. I do want to make note that in his Life of Themistocles, Plutarch gives a slightly different and more favorable version of the story. In Plutarch's version of the story, Themistocles does still send his servant to warn Xerxes that he's holding the Greeks back and that Persia should make their retreat while the Greeks are actually being held back. But the reason that he sends this warning to Xerxes is slightly different in this version. Here, Themistocles was actually convinced by those who argued that Persia should be allowed to retreat. They said that it made no sense to, quote, capture Asia in Europe, and that this swayed the mind of Themistocles. They said rather that Greece, quote, must not tear down the bridge that's already there, Nay, rather, we must build another bridge alongside it, if that be possible, and cast the fellow out of Europe in a hurry. That's how Plutarch puts it. So in this version, Themistocles is fully convinced by the argument, and he plots to send this message to Xerxes just to effectuate and hasten the Persian retreat from Greece. It's not actually for the double slightly underhanded reason of also getting himself an insurance policy against possible issues that he might suffer from his own countrymen later on. Now, in my cynically tinged view, you might call it, it is quite likely that he sent the message for both reasons, and that in the version that Plutarch gives us here, Themistocles could have easily sent Xerxes the message to actually hasten Persia's retreat, to please his own countrymen, whether he was convinced or not, but at the same time the message could have been used to present Xerxes with the impression that Themistocles was doing him a favor. Really, it was a win-win for Themistocles, and there was no downside for him to do this. So, now that we have seen some of the tactical moves at Andros concerning Greece's immediate decisions, it's time that we try to get a grasp on the state of relationship between Athens and Sparta, especially, but even some of the other city-states, 
that play a role in the aftermath of the Greco-Persian Wars, and how those relationships may have progressed even over the course of the war. It is probably going to be some complex, high-level stuff to try to pack into a small box, so please keep that in mind if it's not engaging necessarily, or if it seems irrelevant. I'm just trying to mine all of the nuance that might be available to us here to sketch a decent picture for us as we move forward. The best way I can think to succinctly state the first point here is that Athens and Sparta had existed in a state of uneasy alliance throughout the Greco-Persian Wars. Athens was really a young, upstart city-state in the grand scheme of Greek history, and in comparison, Sparta was established as the hegemony in the Peloponnese, and the traditional city-states that held sway were places like Corinth, Aegina, Thebes, even Argos and Megara. Through the vision of Themistocles, as we have seen over the course of episodes, Athens rapidly rose to assume a leading role at the diplomatic table, thanks mainly to her naval power that was built up rapidly, and how integral a role it held in the Greek defense against Persia. The reality on the ground throughout the Greco-Persian War, though, was that Sparta was still technically the leading power of the Greek world, and this does cut a little counter to some of the modern portrayals and really the modern ideas that we easily get, uh, seeing the entire course of history for both Athens and Sparta and some of the cultural focus that Athens tends to take. Sparta commanded the military actions during the war, and although the navy efforts were clearly masterminded by Themistocles, Sparta was the technical commander, and like Eurybiades, as we've seen, was the technical captain during the naval engagements as well. So, after the victory at Salamis and the aborted pursuit of Persia, decisions did still have to be made about which direction to take heading forward. The Greek allied forces were at Andros, but what were they going to do from that point? The path that Themistocles chose to go down from that point is one that you may not have expected based on the portrayal of him so far, as we have seen it, and as most ancient histories tended to portray it. We have shared a lot of what Herodotus and others had to write and to say about Themistocles, but it's clear from the next act in this story that, well, there probably is more to the story of Themistocles than we will ever truly know. Although he was a hero in Athens and Greece, such that Sparta and the other Greek cities vowed to shower him with gifts and prizes when they later convened to celebrate heroism and the victory at Salamis, Themistocles dictated some actions at Andros that cut in a slightly different direction. It's even more surprising to read that he carried out this stuff without the knowledge of the other commanders or cities. Apparently, Themistocles had Athenians who were loyal enough to him to carry out the policy on behalf of Athens and to really keep it secret from all the other Greek city-states. So what is it I'm referring to here? Herodotus tells us that Themistocles demanded money from the citizens of Andros, and that Andros was only the first city from which he demanded funding after the victory at Salamis. It seems that the common element these cities shared was that they had all medized during the conflict with Persia. They had fought on the side of Xerxes, or at the very least they had subjugated themselves to him and not actively fought against Persia. Themistocles surely justified his demand of funds from these cities in his own mind with the view that, you know, it was just a payment for the Athenian role in defeating Persia, that these cities owed it to him and to his navy that had liberated Greece. Herodotus says that when these cities complied, they, quote, sent the money out of fear, which 
is understandable. Andros, though, being the first city that Themistocles demanded money from, was also the first city to refuse. And in response, Athens laid siege to the city, presumably after the rest of the Greeks had departed. Um, but because Andros, the city, was situated high atop a hill on an island, the city was surrounded by a large wall that also enclosed the harbor, too, so Athens failed in the siege and Andros got away without payment. Still, we read that Themistocles managed to threaten payment out of many other city-states. Many of these were island city-states from eastern Greece and other nearby regions that had medized just to escape destruction at the hands of Xerxes. So, no doubt, some of them would have felt that they traded oppression from Xerxes for a similar but slightly different flavored oppression by Themistocles, who claimed to be a countryman of theirs, in a sense. To me, it feels like it is here, at these early attempts to force money out of other Greek city-states in order to support the continued operation of Athens's ships and the continued power of her military and political leader, it's here that I start to see the early seeds of what will later become the Delian League, as historians call it. Now that is getting a bit far ahead of ourselves, I'm sure that many of you will recognize the League that I'm referencing here, and I promise we will cover it fully in the near to medium distant future. That League, of course, had a more specific purpose and origin, but the Athenian mindset is what I'm trying to focus on here. This mindset to try and extract money and treasure to fund military dominance, in a sense. We can trace this back even further than when that league is formed. It does seem like a ripple on the surface that also indicates tension between Athens and Sparta more narrowly, and it's something that Xerxes maybe tried to exploit following his retreat from Athens. We see this in a story that Herodotus shares about how Sparta sent a herald to Xerxes. The Persians had partially retreated from Athens at this point, maybe a few weeks or months after the defeat at Salamis. They were in Thessaly, uh, northern Greece. The Spartan herald who came to the Persian army here said that Sparta, quote, demanded satisfaction for murder because you killed our king as he was trying to protect Hellas. This, we assume, is a reference to the fact that Leonidas and the famous 300 Spartans died at Thermopylae. In the face of this demand from a Spartan herald, Xerxes simply laughs, which, you know, is not surprising. But the fact that Sparta even seemed willing to entertain the idea of monetary compensation connected to defeat at a battle or just in any connection with the war as a whole, the fact that they would take money seems to be a strange indicator that it was at least on their mind, and it's a little surprising to hear that they would entertain money just at all. They didn't say directly that this would end any conflict Sparta had with Xerxes, they portrayed it just as satisfaction for murder, but if we read between the lines, it seems like they're entertaining the idea that compensation from Xerxes and Persia's retreat would be enough to end the hostilities in Sparta's mind. As I say, it's just a troubling sign coming so close after Salamis that both Sparta and Athens were taking you know, rather surprising steps to try and wring compensation out of the aftermath of the battle and the war. Of course, war is an expensive thing, but the way that they each approach these situations makes it uh, more likely, and if we read between the lines again, it just seems to indicate that Athens and Sparta did not trust one another at all, and that Xerxes probably played them against one another by offering peace all around, trying to make one city-state bite, and to make the other suspicious of all the rest. Remember that this was the advice that was given to Xerxes from Thebes, 
about how to defeat the Greeks without using military force. They could just play them against one another and to toss some money around. So then, after the Spartan demand for compensation was laughed off, Xerxes does indeed retreat all the way back to Susa, and it was in that stretch that he supposedly survived that sinking ship and then gave the helmsman back-to-back gifts of a golden crown and beheading. I would assume that he then took back the crown, so overall maybe just one gift was given there if we do the math, but the helmsman came out the worse in the whole deal, you could say. Anyhow, Mardonius and the armed forces who were going to give conquest another shot had retreated to northern Greece to winter. This is in the fall and winter after the victory for Greece at Salamis, and the Greeks who had been on Salamis, they returned to their city, to Athens, or to their respective homes to rebuild. Then, those who had directly participated in the war, especially political and military leaders, they took some time to go back to the island of Salamis, the site of their victory, to celebrate and to divide the spoils of war, after which they proceeded to the Isthmus of Corinth, also to vote for prizes and to continue the celebration. There are a few passing things I want to point out here. One is that there's a noteworthy spoil from the war that was presented to the gods as sacrifice, and this spoil or spoils were three Phoenician triremes, presumably damaged and taken during the Battle of Salamis. One of these triremes was dedicated at the Panhellenic Shrine at the Isthmus of Corinth, and in his histories Herodotus writes that he saw this trireme monument with his own eyes there at Corinth. The other two triremes were dedicated on Salamis itself, and then as a dedication to Poseidon, at Cape Sunium on Attica. Then finally, victory offerings were sent to the temple at Delphi, where they made a statue 12 cubits, or about 18 feet tall, and in the hand of this statue was the beak, which we can take to mean the ram and the front prow of an enemy trireme. So all in all, we see clearly the defeated ships from Persia's navy were central elements in many monuments that were built after these victories in the Greco-Persian War. As we said, though, the smaller focus for the leaders after Salamis in the fall and winter was to divide the spoils, to make some tithes and sacrifices at Salamis, and then to vote on who should receive the prize of valor for his action during the war. This vote was a sacred vote. Each man walked to the altar of Poseidon alone and voted individually. Now, despite the sacred nature of this vote, quote-unquote, it was reported that during the first vote, every man present voted for himself to win the prize of valor. Maybe we just call this healthy self-confidence? Um, Perhaps it veers more toward the presence and indulgence of large egos. Who really knows? There might be a cultural element of the uh, Greek culture at play here. Either way, it was reported that they took a second vote, since the first one was tied at one all around. And in the second vote, every man's second vote was given to the same man, Themistocles of Athens. This resulted in Themistocles not getting the official prize for valor because no one technically did. The first vote was tied, as we said. But the second vote, you know, made it clear to everyone involved who everybody else really thought deserved it, and um, they just didn't want to formally recognize it. So Themistocles did not get the formal prize of valor. Perhaps, again, this involves egos and how other city-states and leaders of Greece maybe didn't want to boost Themistocles' ego any larger than it already was, especially given the thoughts that they surely knew were bubbling of Athenian empire in his mind. Perhaps it was just jealousy as well. No matter what, 
they all left Corinth without formal thanks given to Themistocles, although Herodotus says that, quote, nevertheless, the fame of Themistocles resounded throughout all of Hellas. It's at this point that we get another glimpse into some post-war maneuvering that went on as concerns Athens and Sparta. Although no one else and no formal vote in Greece was willing to recognize the contribution that Themistocles made to the war effort, Sparta herself proved willing. It's unclear if they extended their gratitude and went out of their way to heap praise on Themistocles, or if, as Herodotus says, that Themistocles took it upon himself to go there because he could get no thanks anywhere else, and he might have suspected that Sparta would curry his favor. Maybe there's no real difference there because the outcome is the same, and both sides probably knew the game they were playing, the dance they were dancing. Sparta didn't really want to roll over and let Athens assume the primary leadership position in the Greek world, but neither did Sparta want to sever ties with Athens altogether. Sparta was militarily secure behind the wall and her strong army, but she also knew that Athens' navy was still key to repulsing any other Persian invasion and it probably played a key role in future events no matter what Persia decided to do. Sparta also knew that Mardonius and the Persian remnant was camped out in northern Greece, and I would maybe bet money that they had heard rumors how Themistocles offered Xerxes escape in the aftermath of Salamis. I'm sure Xerxes twisted that message to his own advantage. So all of these things sort of just beneath the surface. From a Spartan perspective, it probably was not inconceivable that Athens could actually go to Persia's side, even though from our perspective here, that might seem unthinkable. If, hypothetically, that would have happened, Sparta and the Peloponnese would have had very little remaining hope for survival. It is with this in mind, then, that, probably gagging a little bit to suppress their distaste, Sparta hosted Themistocles in Sparta and paid him honors that no other Greek had ever before received from Sparta. In fact, no Greek after this would ever again receive the honor guard of 300 Spartan soldiers that were arranged for Themistocles, not to mention the olive wreath prize for valor and the gift of Sparta's most magnificent chariot. Sparta's honor guard for Themistocles and their gifts to him might seem like obvious flattery, perhaps even more, and some Spartans did indeed find it demeaning. But it wasn't long before the reasons they gave these gifts and honors came back into play. The timeline is a bit hazy, as it is after Salamis, but we know that after Greece decided to leave the bridge intact that we've talked about, and that Xerxes himself had finally fled back east, that the Persian fleet winters off Samos. The army is in northern Greece, the fleet is off Samos. Their presence there was intended to discourage any rebellion in Ionia. Remember that several rebellions had occurred there already, some of them with direct ties to Athens, to Sparta and to the early stages of the war. Mardonius and Persia's army were north, wintering in Thessaly, but with the break of spring, the Greek fleet began to reassemble at Aegina. There, Ionian messengers did reach them, and they indeed begged for further intervention on their behalf against the Persian occupation in Ionia. The Greek fleet was not able to come to their aid again this time, and the fleet remained at Aegina. Mardonius, meanwhile in northern Greece still, began consulting oracles, and he enlisted the ruler of Macedon to take a message to Athens, an offer from Persia. The Macedonian ruler that Mardonius utilized was a man called Alexandros, a man who had close ties to Athens 
he was known as a Phil Helene, a lover of Greece. Mardonius figured that this might make Athens more receptive to the message. And that's pretty, it's a pretty shrewd move, actually. Mardonius's motivation here is clear. Athens possessed the greatest portion of the Greek navy, and that was the thing that prevented another Persian invasion from happening. If they could win the allegiance of Athens and effectively win all of Greece, well, that's how Persia viewed this. Athens was the key. Persia's offer to Athens was basically this. You are the only Greek city that we will forgive. Join us and live. You can have your city, your region back. We'll even give you another region to rule over on our behalf. The clear implication here being that Athen or that Persia would give Sparta to Athens. So we can see the underhanded way that Xerxes and Mardonius are trying to pit Greek cities against one another. In essence, though, they are telling Athens, you have nothing to gain by standing against us because our forces are immeasurable, and you can fight back again now, but we're going to come back over and over no matter what. You might as well take this offer. We are going to level Sparta and you stand between us and them, so join us, or you will die with Sparta. But if you join us, you could have Sparta. Of course, as we said, this was a ploy to sow discord among the Greeks to pit them against one another. So Sparta heard about this offer, and of course, knowing this naval strength and how key Athens was to a defense, they rushed to Athens to contribute their argument into the mix. Apparently in Laconia, there was a prophecy that Sparta was destined to fall to the Medes and the Athenians together. Seeing the imminent potential for this, what would have been previously unlikely alliance, Sparta was now more quickly driven to beg Athens to remain steadfast against Persia. I won't get into the nitty-gritty here, it has a lot to do with points of honor and justice among the Greek city-states, but Sparta also points out that Persia has proven untrustworthy to this point, and that even if Athens took the promise, they couldn't trust that Persia would keep it. As I've said in this whole scene, we see the underlying um, machinations of Xerxes, Mardonius, and Persia. In the version of this story that Herodotus gives us, Athens turns out to not really even give a second thought to the proposal from Mardonius. They just flat refuse Persia's offer, while the Spartan representatives stand there and witness the refusal. Athens does this, Athens refuses because, quote, she's devoted to freedom. And then they say, we find it disgraceful that Sparta became so frightened since they should have known that there's no amount of gold anywhere on earth so great that we would accept it as a reward for medizing and enslaving Hellas. So here in this portrayal, Athens is definitely cast in the best light, as we you know, have seen fairly often. There may have been more behind the story, but we know that Athens did ultimately refuse and in the end, they merely asked Sparta for her army, contribute to help with the defense of Attica, since it is clear by now that Mardonius is going to invade Athens again after hearing about the refusal. So let's fast forward now to the Persian march south. Mardonius arrives to find Attica and Athens abandoned once again. Athens had repeated their previous move and evacuated to Salamis since it worked the first time. Ensconced on the island there, with their fleet nearby again, they received the same offer from Mardunius, but this time we presume it was the last offer. Each Athenian on the council rebuffed the offer again, although there is one counselor who argued to his fellows that they should entertain the thought that it was the best offer they were going to get. 
Herodotus tells us that his fellows were unsure if he truly believed this was the best choice for Athens, or if, as was more likely, he had maybe been bought off by Persia to try and persuade his fellow Athenians. Regardless of the true motivations, the Athenian council backed their previous position by turning on this lone voice to uh, Medes. They just stoned him right there in the council. Case closed, I guess. Decision made. Now, Athens had not evacuated back to Salamis the second time as their preferred option, though. I maybe implied that they did it because it worked the first time. They had hoped to avoid this, but it was a fallback option. And the reason that they had to do it this time around is that uh, Sparta just didn't show up. Sparta had promised to help the defense of Attica after begging as we saw a moment ago, Athens not to defect. But if this was so important to Sparta, it's confusing why they didn't put their army where their mouth was. Mardonius showed up in Attica, and the Athenians were forced to evacuate. Where was Sparta, though? Well, as we have seen in previous parts of this saga up to this point, Sparta took her time coming to the aid of a neighbor. And again here, Sparta's excuse was that there was a religious festival that had to be observed, and that nothing whatsoever could take priority over the Hyacinthia, which was a festival in remembrance of Apollo. Now, we can't know for sure if there was more to their delay than meets the eye, but the Athenians and Herodotus certainly intimated as much. The Spartans had been building a fortification wall across the Isthmus of Corinth. Their hope was that it would help keep out Persia's invasion of the Peloponnese if things got to that point. Now that things have reached the point where Mardonius is marching south and Athens has to choose whether to stand firm or evacuate, Sparta is a no-show. And conveniently, the defensive wall they had been building was actually completed by this point. The timing kind of begs the question, then. Was Sparta just kind of promising to come to Athens' aid and begging Athens not to defect? Was this just them trying to buy a few extra months to finish their wall? Then they would just hide behind it, regardless of what they had promised? Uh, Athens certainly asked that question, and... They were very suspicious of Sparta at this point. Now, we can't know for sure what the motivations of Sparta were, or if the religious festival was truly the only thing delaying them. If they did indeed plan to just hide behind their defensive wall, I think it's a pretty poor strategy, because the wall did not block the sea, and Persia had a large fleet, as we've seen. If Sparta feared Athens joining with Persia, and let's imagine that this did happen, Sparta would have a wall to hide behind on land. Great. But uh, Athens and Persia together would have had an enormous fleet. They would just sail around the wall, and they could have landed armies at various places in the Peloponnese. They could have just starved out the Peloponnese as well. So it's a flawed plan if that is what Sparta was thinking. Ultimately, Sparta did come to the aid of Athens, but it took an influential outsider to persuade Sparta that defending Athens was still in her own best interest. A man named Kilios of Tegea says this in the history of Herodotus. He says, quote, Honorable Ephors, and Ephors are leaders in Sparta, if the Athenians are not united with us, but become allies of the barbarian instead, then no matter how strong a wall is extended across the isthmus, there will be gates flung wide open for the Persian to enter the Peloponnese. So take heed before Athens decides to do something that will bring disaster to Hellas. Apparently, it was this advice that broke the camel's back which maybe the implied advice here is along the lines of what I had imagined earlier, and that the fleet also had a big role to play. 
not simply the defensive wall. I'm sure there's more to the story than Herodotus conveys, though. In the end, Sparta sent 5,000 hoplites to aid Athens, and it is at this point that I am really going to condense and speed things along. Mardonius, we read, had planned his entire approach on the hope that Athens would capitulate without a fight. So, when 5,000 Spartan hoplites made it out of the Peloponnese and began marching toward Athens, Mardonius and the Persians just chose to retreat. They knew that they couldn't fight against this force, so they looked for an advantageous ground on which to fight. Although they did burn Athens on the way out, which would make for a second time in as many years, no surprise there. The Persian force that Mardonius had retained in Greece was pretty reliant, pretty heavy on cavalry, so he was looking for ground that would suit that type of battle, but would also allow him routes of escape if they were needed. He found that site at Plataea, a city in Boeotia, not too far south of Thebes. This site became the site of the famous Battle of Plataea, being that it was an entirely land-fought battle, we are going to sum it all up by saying merely that Greece won again. Mardonius was killed during the battle, and a sizable portion of Persia's army was also defeated. It was the final death blow to her army's ambition in Greece, basically. There is, however, a bit more left to say about the navies involved, which brings us to the Battle of Mycale, one that a few listeners have gone out of their way to ensure will be covered. And fear not, we are now to the battle. This Battle of Mycale was supposed to have taken place on the same day as the Battle of Plataea. That is what Herodotus claims in his histories, and it's what the Greek tradition holds. Again, it seems to line up a bit too perfectly to be true, just how the histories claim that Thermopylae and Artemisium were also fought on the same day, um, but we'll just let this all be. It makes for some good symbolism, if nothing else, to have battles so far separated happening at the exact same time. The instructive piece for us is that in the same time frame that Spartan soldiers and other Greek forces were defeating Persia's remaining army at Plataea, the remainder of Greece's navy had also assembled, and they had made their way east to Samos, as we mentioned. We saw earlier that the remnant of the Persian fleet had holed up for the winter in Ionia or thereabouts, but you know, this puts them far enough away from Greece's fleet, from Salamis and Aegina, that Persia knew her fleet was safe for the winter at least. However, with the break of spring and the emergence of Sparta's army from behind their wall, the Greek fleet received messengers from Ionia again asking for Greece's fleet to come to their aid to attack Persia's remaining contingent of ships in Ionia and to liberate the Ionians from Persian control. The argument here is that at the mere sight of Greece's fleet, Ionia would erupt into revolt, and that on top of that, the Persian ships that had remained there were in such disrepair, and the men were so demoralized that these ships might just flee at the sight of Greece's navy over the horizon. Do recall, of course, that these ships all probably escaped straight from Salamis, so they may have indeed been suffering. It's within the realm of reason to think that the Persian fleet in Ionia was uh, not in great shape. After they make sacrifice and obtain favorable omens, the Greek fleet does indeed prepare and sail east for Samos, ready for this final showdown. They arrive here and they drop anchor, preparing for this engagement with a pared-down version of Persia's navy. And it seems, uh, at least from the words of Herodotus, that the intelligence they had received from Ionia was pretty accurate. Persia's fleet was so demoralized and unwilling to fight another naval engagement 
that they actually took a rather unexpected route. Xerxes had sent this portion of the fleet to Ionia, we've said, but he had also sent an army there to help suppress any potential revolt in Ionia. When Persia's navy saw Greek ships again cresting the horizon, her commanders just fled. They fled straight for the protection of Persia's remaining armed forces in Ionia. They were stationed at Mount Mycale, which is a mountain in western Anatolia. It's within sight of the island of Samos, and it abuts the sea pretty directly. So again, in the words of Herodotus here, he writes, quote, The Persian commanders of the fleet planned to take refuge under the protection of their army. They intended to beach their ships and surround them with a palisade as a defensive wall to serve both as a shelter for the ships and as a refuge for themselves. And we read further that this is just what they did. On the slopes of Mount Mycale, on the beach there at its foot, they hauled their ships all ashore. They felled trees and built rudimentary walls around their ships to form a palisade. This all really makes for an odd picture in my mind, to be honest. A rough fort surrounded by timber and maybe stone, maybe pointed uh, timber even, to make a last-ditch palisade bulwark with perhaps several hundred beached ships at the center. It's definitely not something that you think of and picture when we talk about naval history in general. Herodotus alludes to the fact that there were 300 ships left in the Persian fleet that was stationed here at Samos. So in the absence of any other indicator or description, it seems reasonable to think that Persia had dragged ashore 300 ships at Mycale and had built walls around them. It seems like quite a lot, but it's pretty clear that the repeated Greek naval victories and the repeated misfortunes that Persia had suffered, well, they had just ultimately broken Persia's resolve and belief. They clearly felt that there were higher odds to just pull all their ships ashore and try to build a fort around them rather than to actually fight a battle on sea. Now, it seems from the record that the Greek navy wasn't close enough to see that Persia actually took this step. When they arrived at Samos, they were a little confused why no opposing ships came out to meet them, why they couldn't even see any opposing ships. But they got closer to carry out investigation, and they did eventually see all Persia's ships beached and surrounded by a makeshift wall. The Persian army stretched along the beach to try and defend all of this. There is a scene where Leotychidas, who is the co-ruler of Sparta, he was also the formal leader of this force who sailed to make battle against the Persians, he sails in a ship close up to the shore, and he yells out to any Ionians who were still part of Persia's navy that they should remember freedom first and foremost. And of course, his aim here is to encourage them to turn against Persia and to fight on the side of the Hellenes. We saw Themistocles use similar ruses once or twice. The way the battle itself plays out is, again, technically as a land battle, but we'll talk about this one a little bit more since the fate of a navy is actually at stake, although all the action's happening on land. So the Greeks made a beachhead to the west of Persia's camp and their makeshift ship fort, and there the Greek forces formed up and prepared to make battle. Soldiers from Athens and other city-states took the low, flat ground along the beach, while the Spartan hoplites formed a line on the left, where the ground was slightly higher and rockier, leading up to the mountains. The idea was that the right wing would engage the Persian forces while the Spartans worked to outflank Persia and attack from the left side, enclosing them as much as they could. This 
tactic, of course, resulted in Athens engaging with Persia's forces first. Persia had created this fort to serve as a defensive work, but it seems that they emerged from the fort maybe to make sure that the action took place away from their defenses, and they formed a line of battle on the beach. As for numbers here, Herodotus gives a figure for the Persian army at 60,000 men, with 300 ships behind their fort walls. The Greeks were supposed to have had 40,000 men, and around 250 ships, though as I have often stated through this whole discussion, the figures from Herodotus are a little hard to verify, and they seem slightly inflated. Now, Herodotus writes that Persia's men fought well at first, but when Athens and her companions decided they would rather win the battle before Sparta's hoplites had a chance to wheel around and to claim the glory for themselves, well, apparently this competition set the Athenians to fighting a bit more effectively, and the Persian troops began to suffer. Many were killed as their line broke, and in the mayhem a large group fell back to the safety of their ship fort walls. The Greeks managed to easily breach these walls, and once Greece had pierced the fortification, Persia's will to fight just dissipated entirely. We read that those not already killed just gave up and attempted to flee. It's at this point that Sparta's soldiers arrived from the hills that they had been maneuvering through, and they cut off escape for a portion of Persia's fleeing men. It's also at this point that some of the Ionian Greeks who had been on Persia's side finally saw the light. They realized that Persia could no longer pressure them into fighting against Greece, and the Samians, among others, revolted and took up arms against Persia. This shift seems to have given all the Ionians back their courage, since most if not all of them followed suit and just revolted against Persia. The remainder of the battle was really just a cleanup operation from that point, so there's not too much more to say. I wanted to close with a simple paragraph from Herodotus. Really, this might be the last full paragraph from him that we read. With the conclusion of Plataea and Mycale, the Greco-Persian War is effectively over, believe it or not. So, I find these few sentences from Herodotus to be noteworthy for their brevity and lack of drama, given the significance of the Greek victory at Mycale. He writes, quote, When the Hellenes had destroyed the majority of the barbarians, both those fighting and those fleeing, they set fire to the enemy ships and to the entire wall. But before they did that, they collected and removed all the spoils to the beach, and there discovered that among the items they had seized were some treasure chests full of riches. After setting fire to the wall, they sailed away in their ships. A fitting image with which to end this battle, and really the war. Greece's navy sailing away back over the horizon. A few things here. First, the looting of the treasure chest feels like something right out of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's an awesome game, by the way. Check it out if you're able and if you have not done so. I have played it a little bit recently and I'm just impressed by it. Second thing here, though, is this image of Persia's naval power, her strength going up in flame. After the epic confrontation at Salamis, where spears and arrows rained down, rams shattered planks and ships sank into bloody waters, after that showdown, it's just a remarkable contrast for me to see that nearly the final portions of Persia's naval strength just go up in flames. But even more remarkable is this image, that they burn not out on the water, after having fallen victim to sabotage or to a superior navy. No, they're just ships piled up on dry land, skeletons of what they could have been almost. Ships just don't feel like ships when they're on land and when they're empty. 
Ultimately, the utter skill and effectiveness of Greece's navy throughout the war had by this point so demoralized Persia's navy that they just gave up without even trying. Despite the fact that at Mycale, the Persian navy probably still outnumbered the Greek navy. So, our story of the Persian War concludes with 300 Persian ships heaped up on the slopes of Mount Mycale. The Persian soldiers flee, and as dusk sets copious clouds of smoke billow into the heavens while ships burn, and Greece's navy departs back over the horizon from which they had come. It's a very dramatic and graphic image with which to conclude the war, I think. In sum, Greece's navy was the salvation that brought her victory over Xerxes and Persia. Themistocles was the architect of the navy, and although we mentioned him a lot at the top of today's episode, I do want to point out that he was conspicuously absent during the navy's final foray over to Ionia and for the victory at Mycale. I'll note at the end here that Plataea and Mycale both occurred in the spring and summer following Salamis, so after a space of at least seven or eight months. Although we saw Sparta felt the need to kiss up to Themistocles, as we talked about, by the time winter had passed and Greece had begun organizing her defense of Athens and the following steps, Plataea and Mycale, we don't see anything about Themistocles being involved. It is an interesting piece of the puzzle, but it's one that I would like to clean up next time. Today was episode 39 where we wrap up the fighting and the naval aspects of the Greco-Persian Wars. As we close the series next time out with episode 40, I plan to trace the final arc of the life of Themistocles. It's an unexpected one, and it's not always tied to naval matters. So, if you aren't familiar with how his story plays out, you might want to tune in, and I will try to work in some naval discussion as well. Otherwise, I do also plan to tie up any loose ends and to hopefully set the stage and outline the things that happened in the wake of victory that also unfortunately set the stage for later conflict within Greece. We did also talk about some of those things today already, but now that we're nearly done with our look at conflict with Persia, it only makes sense to now turn our attention to the internal conflict in Greece that has become such a hallmark of ancient history. I'm referring, of course, to the Peloponnesian War. As usual, though, that is getting us ahead of ourselves. I know we have been mired in this period for quite some time now, and there's the thought that I might do some standalone or isolated topic episodes between this series on the Greco-Persian War and the coming series on the Peloponnesian War, kind of just as a palate cleanser or something along those lines. If there are specific topics of interest that you want to see covered in that uh, interlude period, I am of course a bit behind on member episodes, so I'm going to dip back into the Persian War material and notes that I now have stacked up to do some special deep dives there, but I'd be glad to cover other stuff that may be of interest and that might make for some shorter bite-sized episodes. Okay, there are several housekeeping items that I want to cover today, and then that will see us through. I appreciate your attention to any or all of them, but as always, they are not at all mandatory, and our substantive discussion today has reached its end. There is an upcoming giveaway to mention, so keep listening if that piques your interest at all. Item one, though, is to let you know about an exciting new app and really an exciting new venture that I have partnered with to help bring the podcast to you in a neat little package. The app and the website is called, appropriately enough, it's called Lyceum. You can find it on both Apple and Android stores. Um, that really covers the major devices that people ever use. I really like this app, and the big selling point for it is that you can listen to the podcast episodes, 
and then you can start a discussion about the episode with other listeners or even with me. I'll be plugged into it. You can just comment right there in the app on the podcast and we can have a running discussion. The discussion platform allows you to attach images. It can all be just conversation, text, thoughts. I really like how listeners have um, started doing suggested reading for other listeners, and I'll share my suggested reading, even feedback, anything really that suits your fancy, we can talk about there in you know the same app that you use to listen to the podcast. I will definitely keep tabs on it, join the conversation, but I like how it opens the door to keep a conversation centralized and tied to each episode's topic or just to keep us more engaged. As things currently stand, I get feedback from a lot of people, and we have a lot of good conversations going on, but it tends to be spread out over, gosh, at least five or six different apps and websites, so common listeners of the podcast don't always seem to interact with one another. I would love for that to increase if we could, and I'd encourage you to check out the app Lyceum and to see if it might sway you to make it a podcast listening platform. It has some other good tools, and it has partnered with a ton of great educational and history podcasts. They have a tool for um, membership functionality as well that I'm going to look at getting plugged in. So our premium content can be available on there as well for anybody who wants to support the podcast, get exclusive content for the same level that current members do. And there are several different outlets for that. But Lyceum is another good uh, weapon to add to the arsenal, if you will. I'm going to include a link to their website and uh, you can find links to the app there as well. Look in the show notes, either on the podcast website or in the app that you're listening to this right now. I always include notes there too. Item number two is a different company that I want to tell you about. It's something that is going to be right up many of your alleys, I think. I actually have bought items from this company a long time ago, prior to ever starting a discussion with them. But they shared some items with me, and I'm now putting together a giveaway that is going to run across the podcast's social media. So then, what is this product? Well, the company is called Maritime Supply Company. They design and they create ocean-inspired jewelry and other accessories. It was their leather anchor bracelet that drew me to them initially. The product is really high quality. I've had no problems with it. I've been really pleased. And they have a lot of other options. There are some really cool brass coin necklaces with designs a wax seal pendant with a compass design. They have a current or recent release that even uses some old Greek coins with ships on them. I really like that one too. There are even more items on top of that, keychains, t-shirts. Uh, so follow the link to them that I'm going to drop in the show notes as well to check them out. I love too that as a small business, uh, Maritime Supply Company donates 10% of their profits. Typically they donate to a clean water nonprofit, which, you know, is is huge. But I think right now they maybe are donating to other nonprofits that are more connected with the current pandemic situation that is going on around the world. So as I mentioned, I will be putting together a giveaway soon. Check out my Instagram page or the Facebook page for updates about uh, which products I'm going to include. I think I'm going to include a couple recent maritime naval history books too. So it might even be a package giveaway you, where you could get a piece or two of jewelry and a book. I will drop a short announcement when that giveaway is live into the podcast feed here, but uh, follow my Instagram page. That one's starting to take off a bit and I try to share cool nautical artwork every day. My third and final item then to wrap us up is just to thank each of you that take time to listen to this humble podcast. Many of you have taken time to leave reviews, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I have lost track lately about who has added new ones and where they're popping up, 
So it would be a little hard for me to backtrack and to read each of those from you. I do want you to know that I really appreciate it. And I just want to issue a thank you to everyone who still supports the podcast. Given my decreased output, I have reduced um, the default support level at every avenue you can lend support for. So anyone who has a membership through the website, I'm planning to reduce you know, the amount of your pledge to a more reasonable level given with what I'm putting out right now. I've reduced the pledges required on Patreon as well to access the premium content. I do appreciate everyone who is on the crew, your support continued through everything that's going on right now. But in this vein, I, I do realize that current times are hard for a not insubstantial portion of folks out there. As I record, we are at the beginning of May 2020. The state I live in in the United States has been operating under travel and business restrictions for almost two months now. And I know that many people have been financially affected by everything that's going on. If you have supported me and this podcast ever before, or if you do right now and you can't afford to any longer, please cancel anything that might recur in the future. Um, if it does happen to recur and PayPal or Patreon, you know, dings your account for funds that you have pledged in the past, but you need those given your current situation, please let me know. I'm glad to refund anybody who needs it. Beyond that, though, um, if you are cooped up like I am right now, which I assume a fair number of people are, and you're binging podcasts to pass the time, but if you can't afford or you just don't want to financially support the podcast right now, maybe you would like to someday when you're able, I get that. If you want extra content to listen to, just send me an email and I will make sure that you get access to the member episodes. There are 10 or 12 of them out there right now, and that totals, I, I would have, guess, around seven or eight hours of extra maritime history to add to your podcast queue. So maybe a solid day's worth of listening. I want to provide that to anybody who either can't afford to support but loves the content or just needs something extra to help make this current climate a little bit more survivable, tolerable. I do hope that all of you out there are staying safe as well. Please be conscientious of those among us out there who are perhaps more vulnerable to a virus like this one that is going around. Even those of us who, like myself, are young and theoretically less vulnerable, we can do our part to help uh, slow transmission and to, you know, prioritize people who may not have it as good as we do or be as lucky as we are. I would encourage you to do your part, and hopefully the seas will eventually calm down again for all of us. Given that I'm cooped up at home right now, hopefully I'll get some more episodes out in the near future. Episode 40, like I said, will wrap up our look at the man Themistocles, and then hopefully we can tie up loose ends while also setting the stage for our next series. Naval matters are at the forefront of the Peloponnesian War, so we will no doubt have a lot to cover there. It is an immensely complex period, and it has been heavily covered by historians, by political thinkers and other strategists and theorists for centuries, honestly, so I'm a little bit hesitant to wade into these waters. But uh, we'll do the best we can. I'll try to keep my focus, as always, mostly on ships and naval issues, and try to sketch out the basics beyond that, since a lot of the things going on in the ancient world and in the politics of the time are interrelated with the naval matters, just like they are today. Anyways, that is where we're headed. I hope you all are staying safe, crew. Otherwise, fair winds and following seas to you. And until we meet again, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.